It is Wednesday afternoon, September 13th, and we are picking up in our study of Romans 9, 10, and 11, Israel past, Israel present, and Israel future. We are in chapter 10, really all the way down to about verse 15, but I'm going to just read little highlights out of chapter 10. Remember in chapter 9, we see that they are rejecting. In chapter 10, Shaul Paul opened it up with his heart plea that his desire is that all of Israel is, it would be saved. That he has such a zeal for them, to, for them to know what he knows experientially, but they don't even have that knowledge. They, are, they try to attain righteousness with God on their own. And for all we know that the law does not bring one to righteousness, it points one to their need. The only one who is righteous according to the law is Messiah himself, who is the end of the law, who is the fulfillment and the completion of it for any and all who would believe. Moshe wrote that to them. Uh, even in his uh, scriptures, and when I say his scriptures, I mean what, what was quoted that Moshe said, not just in Shaul Paul's day, I'm taking you all the way back into, let's just round it off and say 1400 B.C., that even there, this message of righteousness by faith was being spoken. That it never was salvation by the law. It was salvation shown to be the need by the law. The law, the holy standard of God, no one can attain it. Uh-oh, we're all in need of God's saving grace. And verses 6 through, oh, about 8, we're saying that God has done it. He has given it to them. It's not up in heaven where they have to try to, somebody get up to heaven and bring it down to them. No. Messiah left heaven and brought it down to them. It's not down in the depths of, of the earth. It's already been conquered. Death represented by the depths of the earth was conquered by Messiah who has brought, been brought up from the dead that he is the conqueror and able to give us that abundant life also. That if uh, according to verse 9, if you confess that Yeshua Jesus, in his deity, fully human, yet fully God, if you are confessing that with your mouth, you're believing that in your heart, it's not just a head knowledge, but it's in your heart, that then you are saved. You, you're, it's, it's a guarantee. It's not on the basis of believing and then doing something, except for, of course, opening your heart. But that, that's just it. And that if you believe in Yeshua Jesus as Messiah, as Savior, as very God himself, you will not be put to shame. You'll not be disappointed. You're not going to find that this is false or, or something that, that falls short. And that this salvation now, because this is something new that they're having to grasp hold of, is for everyone, whether they be Jewish or whether they be Gentile. Why is that such a change? Because we know up until the time when Yeshua had died on the cross for forgiveness of sin, anyone who was not Jewish had to proselyte into the Jewish faith. It's called Judaism today, but they were coming into the true um, beliefs of the one true and living God, the God of Israel. There is no other living God. Every other God is a dead God. The heathen, the nations, are full of idolatry, worshiping dead gods. But the only God who is alive and the only God who could save was the God of Israel. We see, by example, Rahab, uh, Rahab, who was a harlot. She's not living a great life. It's not by her works. It's not by being pious or, or wonderful. But she said to, to the, the spies as they came, we've heard about your God. When your God comes... In, with you to conquer us, I want to be on your side, basically is what she's saying. I want to put my faith in the God of Israel. And she was saved. She was spared her physical life. She was saved spiritually, and even find, we find her in the line to Messiah that she was brought in. But now everyone who wants to come into the saving faith is no longer by proselyting into Judaism. Both Jew and Gentile come the exact same way. They come through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, put on the altar for the forgiveness of sin for all who will believe. This is the, the main change. And then um, verse 14 it goes on with that. How then are they, and the they here is referring to the Jewish people. How is it possible for the Jewish people to call on him, to call on Yeshua, the, the Lord that we've just been talking about, Adonai Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, 
how then are they to call on, in him, on him Sorry, in whom they've not believed? How are they going to do this if they haven't believed? Well, obviously, if they're not believing, they're not going to be calling on the right name. So it goes on with the next question then, and how are they to believe in him who they've not heard? They need to hear. They need the good news. How are they going to hear without a preacher? And a preacher means one who proclaims. Right here is reason why we need to be speaking the gospel truth to the ends of the earth. We need to be the voice so that the people can hear, so that they can get saved. And that's what Shaul Paul is bringing out here, is that they need to, to hear. There's got to be one who will go, one who will proclaim. And I don't mean one, <laughs> but, you know, whoever God is telling you, touching your heart to go, you need to go. And that go may be next door. That go may be in your own home. That go may be in a store. That go may be around the world. But we know keeping it in the context here also, especially in relation to the Jewish people, it, it's being said, you know, they've got to hear and understand. What do they have to hear and understand? What's the problem? They're not hearing and understanding Yeshua Jesus is their Messiah. They're looking still for King Messiah, not suffering servant. They're looking for that set up the kingdom, break Rome's control over us, set us free, and we'll know that you are our Messiah. But he had to deal with the sin that was binding them first. They had to have that broken so that they could then obtain the promises of the, the millennial reign that would come. Would they have accepted him as very God himself, Messiah being deity, then they would have gone into those kingdom promises also. But we know that isn't what happened. And now, how are they going to believe if someone doesn't go? And verse 15, that how are they to preach unless they are sent? That doesn't give you an excuse. That doesn't mean it's only for your preacher who you sit before on a Sunday morning that he's the only one to go. No, we all can be preachers. We all can be the mouth, mouthpiece for God. The witness. The witness, yes. We all... And we should be witnesses. We should be eyewitnesses to what he's done in our life and willing to share that with others also. But what does it mean to be sent? It means to be sent on a commission. We get from this same verb, we get the word apostle. Apostle means a sent one. So yes, we do have those that, that we see have divine authority in scripture that were given that title, but that doesn't mean that you can't be an apostle today because an apostle is literally a sent one. Uh, and so um, I've lost my place. Sorry. How are they believe? No. How are they? Okay. Where am I? Verse fifteen. That's my problem. But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written. Okay. We're going to look where it's written in a moment. We're going, as soon as you see that, you know it's in the Jewish scriptures. We'll go back to that in a minute. But what are we going to read? Um, I'm having trouble keeping my place today. I'm sorry. Just as it is written. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Okay, now, originally they're talking right there. But because this is a quotation, we have to realize it's more than just in, we're writing, Paul was writing to the Romans, they're living in Rome, and, and I don't mean just, uh, believing ones are the ones that he's writing to. But let me take you what I'm trying to say, and I'm, I'm saying it very poorly, but hopefully you're getting my... The context of what I'm trying to say. Go with me to Isaiah, Yeshaya, Isaiah chapter 52. This is where the quote originally comes from, Isaiah chapter 52 <clears throat> and verse 7. In Isaiah's day, it says, How delightful on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news. Does this sound like what Shaul Paul's drawing from? Yes, it is exactly what he's drawing from who announces peace, announces shalom, brings good news of happiness. What's the good news of happiness that he brings? Who announces salvation, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Zion, Zion to Jerusalem, to Israel, your God reigns. This Isaiah is bringing out is that in God, salvation is found. We know that through Yeshua, Jesus, this is the good news. This will bring peace. This will bring that eternal happiness. This is beautiful. 
the feet who carry this message, they're beautiful feet because they're spreading this good news, this news to deliver them. Now, in Isaiah's day, that salvation that they're going to be looking for and the deliverance they're going to be looking for is not from Rome. Rome's not the issue. Rome's not even around at this point. It's going to be from Babylon. They're, they're needing deliverance from Babylon. They're going to be facing 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Let me take you to another time. Take you to the book of Nahum. Nahum, chapter 1. Nahum, Nahum chapter 1, and verse 15. Where is the, is the deliverance in this verse? Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. We've got the same sound here. Now I've got Isaiah, I've got Nahum the prophet, and I've got Shaol Paul. All three saying the same thing. We're getting a witness. We're getting a testifying out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Um, again, it's announcing Shalom. Celebrate your feast, Judah. Okay, obviously this was a message to Israel. Pay your vows. Do what you are supposed to do to be right before God. For never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is eliminated completely. At this time... The ten northern tribes are dealing with Assyria. They're needing deliverance from Assyria. They're being promised a future time when the wicked one will no longer be able to take them into captivity. They honestly have not seen that in its entirety and its completeness to this very day. Yes, Israel was freed from Assyria. Actually, what happened is Assyria got swallowed up by Babylon. The two southern tribes went into captivity in Babylon. So now all 12 tribes are in captivity together in Babylon. The 70 years pass. We know it's the time of Daniel, Daniel when he, he's being raised up and says, Hey God, it was written 70 years. We're, we're getting there. We're pretty close. What's going to happen? And we know through his prayers, the door does open. And there is a remnant that goes back to Israel. Ezra and Nehemiah refer to this time the rebuilding of the temple the rebuilding of, of the streets of jerusalem that's prophetic in its prophecy fitting in with daniel's great prophecy that told them when messiah would be coming but again they should have been expecting him and they should have known it they should have been able to, to identify on the basis of the prophetic scriptures but he came humble lowly riding on a donkey even though this was what was prophesied yet they were looking for that king so that they missed him. But my point here is, each time the people needed salvation from the enemy, but the greater picture we see is the salvation needed from the enemy of our souls, the one that, that has us bound in sin, and that's what the break needs to, to come from. And that's why it is something beautiful. That beautiful, the word from the Greek, means like a full bloom. It's fully developed. This is something that's complete. It's full of vigor. It's not something that's on its way. It's not a rose that's starting to open up. It's the open rose. And the feet show a swiftness, a vigorness. They, they earnestly are desiring. They, they're putting feet to their prayers. To, they're taking action. It, someone said that it's like winged movement. I, I laugh because... We don't have wings on our feet, but we get the idea. Swift, go, share the word. This is beautiful. And what is this beautiful word that is relevant in Isaiah's day, relevant in Nahum's day, relevant in Paul's day, relevant in 2021? It's not just deliverance from a people holding a physical people captive. It's the deliverance of the soul from sin that they are set free forever and able to have uh, the, more than just the, the physical blessings that Israel will receive in the land. This is the message. This is what our Jewish people need to hear, that they can have that, that forgiveness, that they can uh, stand before their God and be found righteous in the presence of a holy God. And the only way they can is to be clothed in the robe of righteousness provided as soon as you put your faith in Yeshua Jesus, who then puts his robe on them or on you or on me so our whole picture really is speaking of, uh, of messiah as that sin offering 
to bring that salvation, to prove that that's the point of what's really being said, that it's more than just a physical and a land type deal. Look at verse um, 16. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Yeshua, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Okay, remember the they? We're still talking about the Jewish people. We're not talking about every individual one. We're talking as a whole, collectively. We're talking about the nation. They didn't, the Jews did not heed the good news. The prophets spoke it, but the people didn't receive it. They weren't lending an obedient ear. They were hearing, but they weren't hearing, or at least they weren't hearing and doing. They weren't giving heed to it. If someone doesn't take action to what you said, it's as if they didn't hear and that's what he's trying to say. What did they not heed? What did they not hear? They missed the good news. They missed the message. And this is sad. They missed these glad tidings. And that's why Isaiah said, Who has believed our report? What report? The report of Messiah. The report of Messiah coming. What did Isaiah say of Messiah? Well, let me take you to Isaiah 53. He didn't say in Isaiah 53, Messiah's going to come, break all the enemies, and set up his kingdom, and sit on David's throne, and be king. That message Shmuel Samuel, the prophet, did give. That message is true. But Isaiah, who's been quoted here, is saying, who's believed our report? He said, and, it, and let's look at Isaiah 53 just real shortly. We won't go through all the verses, but th this is what he's saying. When, when he said, who has believed us? What is he talking about? He's talking about his description of Messiah. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is still verse 1. Verse 2 tells us that he's a tender shoot out of dry ground. This is something that, that it's like the acacia tree that grows in the desert. You wonder how that tree manages to grow because it's so dry around it. It wasn't anything that was just so beautiful and lush and lovely that we looked to it. He didn't have that kind of appeal. He was not drawn, people weren't drawn to him by his beauty. He was despised instead. He was abandoned. They hid their faces from him. And then it goes on and it says that, that he was afflicted by God, pierced for our offenses, crushed for our wrongdoings. We don't see a king in here, do we? We don't see victory here. We see suffering. That one that came as a servant of God who suffered. In verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't even open his mouth to complain. He was like a lamb that's led to the slaughter. He kept his mouth shut. And yet, on him, all the sins of the people were put. I skipped that by accident. That was verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each turned his own way. The Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. This is the picture they should have seen and they should have known. That he would be crushed in verse 10. That he would be the guilt offering. That this is what's going on. But notice also, verse 11. Even when God gave the picture of the suffering servant and the one who would deal with sin. Verse 11 is key and it's important. My servant will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. He, this servant, is going to be able to justify others by bearing their wrongdoing. That's Messiah becoming the sin offering for the people. And then in verse 12 tells us, even though that he would be poured out to death, he'd be accounted among those who had died, still he is the one who bore the sin of many and interceded. For the wrongdoers. Where do you intercede? At the throne of heaven. This is their Messiah. This is the report, the good news. But who has heard it? The same thing is still true in all Paul's day, and I hear it echoing in my voice today, especially because literally, when, when no matter when you listen to this class, if you listen uh, when it's not live, tonight at sundown is Yom Kippur the most holy day on the Jewish calendar, the day that they need to be putting, or not they, but the high priest needs to be putting blood on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies to attain salvation for them to cover their sins for another year. But it's not happening. They're doing all kinds of other things to substitute for it, but they can only make a sacrifice in Jerusalem at the temple, and there is no Jerusalem temple today that's standing that they can make a sacrifice 
So they've tried to do everything else they can to get right before God. And they believe God's opened two books, a book of death and a book of life. And they hope that at the end of this day, their name's in the book of life because they've gotten everything right between themselves and God and themselves and their fellow man. They're not looking to the fact that right here they're told the servant of God took the punishment for them, took their sin for them. Leviticus 17.11 tells us God gave them the blood for atonement. God put it on the mercy seat for the atonement of, of all. That's what is being said and being seen here, and yet who is believing that report? Thankfully, there's a remnant, but sadly, we are the small in number who have come to realize and understand this is our Messiah. And as we've said already in this class, he didn't just come and live a, a good life and die. He came and lived the perfect life. He kept the law so that he did not need to die for the sin of himself. Therefore, by freely giving his life, shedding his blood, it could be the atonement in place of for whosoever will come in and receive it. That's what they were being told, had been told, this was the picture, here's the completion, but who is hearing? Who is being obedient to this report? As we go back to Romans uh, chapter 10 and verse 16, in that thought, keep that thought right there for you. I think we're in, we're still in, are we in 16? You know what, I'm in the wrong chapter. Yep, that's my problem. Okay, chapter 10 and verse, yes, verse 16. Um, Lord, who has believed our report? Who's heard this glad news, this good tidings? Who has heard it? And we know directly from Isaiah to today, we still should be hearing it. And that's why, and literally when it says report, it's the hearing of the report from the way that the verb is being uh, given in the Greek. And this leads us right into verse 16. Uh, I'm sorry, I've done verse 16, into verse 17, which says, so faith comes by hearing. See, they need to be hearing it, hearing by the word of Christ. Now, where in that hearing do you see, do this, do that, and you will finally get enough brownie points, you'll be right with God. It doesn't say that, does it? It says it's by faith. Remember where the verses were earlier that they received righteousness by faith, not by their, uh, their works. No one, uh, Isaiah told us, our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. But here what is being said, that that hearing is literally the, the how do I say it? How do you put faith into making it a verb? It's a verb and a noun at the same time. But they need to be taking that step of faith. They need to be acting out in their faith. They need to be hearing the report and receiving it to themselves. And this is what he's saying to our Jewish people, that, that faith comes by hearing. Hearing? Hearing what? Hearing the word yes, of, God. and your English may say Christ, but remember that's the hearing of the anointed one. Hearing of the Messiah. Hearing of the Mashiach. Faith, the source of what it comes the hearing of the, the gospel truth through the agency, through the word, not, not saying through the word, although he is the word. But this is meaning as the word is being spoken, as I'm speaking this truth right now, may any Jewish people who have yet to believe hear these words, hear them, by faith receive them, then they will have that atonement. And that's what's being said. Hearing. The words that are being spoken of the anointed one. Don't miss who he is. Don't miss that Messiah is very God himself, but he's also 100% human because he had to take on humanity, human race, be a human, to save the humans. He couldn't be an alien and save the humans. He had to come into our realm, be our kinsman, redeemer. And this is what Shaul Paul is crying out for them to hear and to take by faith. No one has to do anything except accept it by faith. That levels the playing field. That means that, that no one's in a better position and somebody in a lesser position. It doesn't mean that you try it all your life. It doesn't mean that every year at Yom Kippur you beg and you plead and you try to do this and you try to do that and you make these substitutes because you can't give the, the sacrifice in Jerusalem. And I'll ask specifically, 
give me a scripture that says, God said, when you can't do a sacrifice, that's okay. You can make up for it by fasting. You can make up for it by saying certain prayers. You can make up for it by taking a chicken and swinging it over your head called swinging Kippur, which is what they're doing at sundown, hoping that that chicken will be a replacement for the lamb that had to be uh, killed in Jerusalem, in the temple, to put the blood on the mercy seat, in the Holy of Holies, by the high priest, no high priest today, no mercy seat, no holy of holies, no temple, no place. Are we condemned? And the answer is no. By faith we believe Messiah did it all. He was the greater high priest, put the, the greater blood on the greater mercy seat, which was in the heavens for forgiveness of sin. Hallelujah. He did it. Now, hear it. Take it into your heart. Receive it. And you will have it. That's what Shaul Paul is crying out. He, he's witnessing, he's testifying, he's pouring everything into it. I've got questions galore. I'm going to start with Loretta. Rhonda, hang on, I lost your sight, so when you come back on and I can find you, there you are, you got moved. <laughs> Loretta, go first. Yeah, about the chicken, the head will come off, right? When you swing it. Well, when they're swinging it, then the chicken is put to death if it didn't die from, from that. But the idea was, it is the substitute. It's dying in their place, just well, like the lamb was supposed to. It was a substitute. substitute. But see, they God doesn't tell it. They didn't lose it. My dad always done that. Yeah, well, you would know them. You yeah, would know better than I. Right? Yeah, yeah. Cause and the chicken will jump all over the ground and smash it in the air. Well, don't miss I've the seen point. That. But don't miss the it's, point. It's horrible. The point and then is. I didn't expect me to eat that chicken. <laughs> I wasn't going to touch it. The point is, there had to be a sacrifice for sin. They catch that. They know they're lacking. They're coming up with, well, God will let us do this then. But give that to me by the word of God. And it's not there. And this is what I want our Jewish people to understand. God didn't give us room for excuses or to make a plan ourselves. It's his way only. That's what, don't miss that. Yes, Rhonda, there you went. We're fighting to get her off mute. There we go. I, yeah, I just heard yesterday, I was doing a, the study and the Jewish, I don't know what his title was, but he literally said, you know, we're always talking about there has to be a sacrifice. And he said, all we have, to, then he started listing all these different Old Testament scriptures. All we have to do is repent and return to him, repent. That blessed sacrifice is not necessary. I couldn't believe it. Sadly, yes. He got it right at the start. Repenting is the first step. Repent is return to God, is teshuva. We do need to repent. That's what these 10 days were supposed to get them to be doing. Repent, to realize, I'm not right before God. But where did God say, no longer, you don't need to do a sacrifice any longer? Where does he draw that from the prophets? Where do we see that in scripture? We're not given that ever, other than the fact that Messiah did it. He took the place. He completed it. He didn't look over it. He did it. He was the sacrifice. Go ahead, Rhonda. He said in response that he, he cited various scriptures that said uh, where the person repented and it was counted to him righteousness. And so I, I have to talk to you later, but it was like, it was against everything I ever heard about what Jewish people believe. So I was just really astounded that that's what he was telling a bunch of. Yeah, women. well, I don't know what level he was at, how much of the scripture he's holding to. Yes, it was counted for righteousness. Like when Abraham, God told him the gospel, showed it to him in the stars, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He didn't sacrifice a lamb at the temple. Right then there wasn't a temple, and that wasn't what he was doing. But he was looking to that sacrifice and believing in that sacrifice, that sacrifice being the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. I would want to ask that, that teacher, where, how, how do we get remission of sin with no sacrifice? Where does it say repentance is enough? Repentance is that first step. Yohanan and John called them to a baptism of repentance, repentance of their sins, but they had to take the next step and put their faith in the one who could wash away their sin. 
You know, so it, it, repenting is just beginning. Repenting is turning around to get right with God. But you've got to have that shedding of blood. There's nowhere I can find that I can get around that in Scripture. There has to be the shedding of blood. Today, for, for Yom Kippur, they're going to afflict their, their physical bodies. They're going to fast. If they're Orthodox, they fast 100%. No water. They're not going to brush their teeth. They're not going to wash their face. And they're not going to swallow a, a, a swallow of water. They do the hardest fast they can. And they say that's afflicting their souls. But I ask you, is your soul thirsty? Is your soul hungry? I don't think so. My physical gets thirsty. My physical gets hungry. But my soul is something different, and that's what's, what has to be right before God. They can kill this flesh, and if the soul has not had atonement, the soul cannot go live in the presence of a holy God. So all this afflicting that they say, oh, well, this is what we do. We afflict our souls. We do fasting. We do prayers that beg for God's forgiveness. Fine and good if you want man's standard, but where does God say that? God is concerned about the heart. Now, does he at times want his people to fast? Yes, but that's for a different purpose. That's not for salvation. And the fasting that many of them did, he says, I don't want your fast. I want your heart. You know, I don't want external. I want internal. Dora. Oh, well, what the, you were saying something I was going to say when God, when Christ died, that's when he said it was Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Good point, Doris. She said, and back to when I was talking about Messiah Christ, the anointed one, shedding his blood. When he shed his blood for the atonement, his own words were, it is finished. finished. Done. Complete. Put a period there. Don't put a comma. And don't put a question mark. <laughs> yes, Sam. Almost. There we go. Do you think that um, the Jewish people today make connection between their inability to follow the law with sin? Because it seems like there's a, a disconnect in trying to grasp the concept of sin in daily, everyday life, and yet it was the law part of the intention of Hashem was to show that we can't possibly begin to meet his standard. Right. I so think there's a disconnect there. Absolutely there's a disconnect. They want to believe that sin is only something really bad. You cheated somebody in business. You brought harm to someone. You took someone's life. This is sin. But sin isn't in the little things. Well then why is there all of this law that says if you break one commandment You've broken 613 commandments. So if you've said one little white lie, and God never colors the lies, that's people. So if you've said one lie, you've committed murder, you've committed adultery, you've committed all. Now, obviously, you didn't go do all of those things, but your, your guilt is all or nothing. And yes, it's a disconnect. Our Jewish people want to believe today they're good people. So God's going to let them in. Well, who says... How good is good enough? Only God could say that. And he did in, in his holy standard. So, yes, you have to pray for them to have the conviction of sin that only the real HaKodesh can bring to them. Because I can't convince them. You can't convince them. How did any of us come to saving faith? We realize I am a sinner. I need a Savior. But as long as you think you can do it on your own, you're not looking for it, the Savior. So it is a disconnect, but it is a, an untruth. Again, Isaiah 64, 6. All our righteousness, all the good we do in God's sight is still filthy rags. So all this good that they think they're doing in God's sight isn't getting there. It just isn't. If I give you a white poster. If I didn't, I would have brought a white poster. Okay, pure white. Picture it. Easy to picture. Take a black pen. Take a ballpoint pen. Okay? Fine point. And in the middle of that white board, just stick a dot. Now, is that white board pure now? No. 
No, that dot has now discolored that whiteboard. That's sin. It doesn't have to be grab your, your Sharpie marker and make a big mark. It doesn't matter what size. It's been contaminated. It's either wholly pure or it's wholly unpure. One little dot, it's all over. If you happen to remember, uh, and I, I certainly wouldn't expect you to just put it on the air, uh, the verse that specifies that, um, you know, one, one infraction is... Oh, um, that the guilty of the whole lot. It's Deuteronomy, Dabarim, 1815 is a prophet like Moses. So I've got the wrong reference in mind. Let me, I will, I, I'll bring it next week. I wish I had it. I should have it. When I get reminded, I'm going to go, oh, yeah. Okay, um, one sin guilty of all. I can I can see where it is on my page in my Bible, but uh, Patty's going to Google for me. And that reminds me, I'm going to take Dora's question, but also last week when you asked me for verses on the rapture, I was in bed Wednesday night and went, oh my word, I didn't give you Titus 2.13. So there's another one. <laughs> one of the... You know, it talks about the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, which is speaking of the rapture, our blessed hope. That's another one, another um, author, another book, another reference. Um, again, if you want a whole list of them, let me know, and I'll give you a whole list. Dora. Okay, is this a question for now, or, or shall we wait till we get to um, Genesis? When did, okay, sin did not start when... Uh, Adam and Eve took the, the devil's word, Satan's word. When did it start? When Abel killed? I mean, no, it actually did start. Sin started when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They disobeyed God by taking the fruit from the forbidden tree. Why did they do it? Eve was deceived by Satan, and Adam willingly joined her. Thank you. It's not James that I want, but James has got it, and I probably have a cross-reference. Yeah, James is very good, but I know it's in, in Deuteronomy oh, also. Yeah. James 2.10 is saying the same thing, and because I've got a Bible of cross-references, while well, I'm answering um, Dora, still, that is when sin entered the world, it entered through Adam. Adam was the head representative of the whole human race. So sin entered, entered the, the race at, at the sin of Adam and Eve. And it carried down to their children, just like today. Children are born with a sin nature. Have you ever raised a child? Do you teach that child to sin? Or does that child sin before you can teach them? I've got a, a brand new, adorable grandniece. She's already shown her temper, <laughs> her will, and her way. <laughs> We're all born with it, and we know it. And I love her to death, and she also is as sweet and uh, loving as can be. Um, so don't let me, you know, especially for mommy and daddy's sake, don't get upset at me. Deuteronomy 27, 26 is probably what I want. I'm running over there. Um, but I'll come back to Dora in just a second. I just if I can finish this up that fast, I will. Deuteronomy 27. And yes, yes, yes. Cursed be he who confirmeth, confirmeth, sorry, not all of the words of this law to do them. Okay? In that, if they don't confirm all to do them, then they are condemned. Um, it doesn't say it quite as clearly as I was thinking. There may still be another reference I want. But you have to confirm all of the words of the law or you're cursed. All means they are obedient to all or they're cursed by the law. So that's an all or nothing that James makes very clear. If you stumble in one point, you're guilty of it all. That's what this is saying also. Um, that all the words of the law? Yes. Or all the, the requirements? I mean, like... Everything that the law says. If oh. you don't keep it all, you're cursed by it. It doesn't say that, well, you can break this commandment and be okay. You can break that rule or that statute or that ordinance and be okay. You're cursed if you don't keep all of it, every single bit, okay? So. Um, they don't believe in baptism, do they? 
Because no, they don't believe in no, Jesus. No, baptism is a picture of dying in in Messiah. That we we die and we go under the water in death, buried in death, and brought out in newness of life. And the newness of life is the abundant life that Yeshua Jesus gives. Because they don't believe in Yeshua Jesus, Jesus. they're not going to go through they're a baptism like that. Do they have a, quote, baptism? It's called a mikvah, and it is a ceremonial cleaning, cleansing. Yes, the high priest had to go through that, or all the priests before they would go into duty would do that. So they have, if you hear... It's washing? Yeah, it's a washing, and it's a ritual That's baptism. cleansing. <clears throat> the washing? It, I don't equate it with baptism because it has oh. nothing to do with baptism. Okay, and that's why when when John the Baptist was baptizing, it was that that um, it was for, it was um, I said it a few minutes ago. How did I put it? I put it well. <laughs> um, repenting of their sin, but it wasn't yet the understanding and the knowledge that we have today of what that's a whole picture of. So when they they followed John, that was the start. That was Teshuvah. That was what I taught to when I was answering Rhonda's question. That's the repenting. That's the starting. Oh wow, I've sinned. I've got to turn back and get right with God. That's how far John could bring them. The greater comes in the belief of Yeshua Jesus, who now we put our faith in him and our sins are washed away and forgiven and we're brought up into the newness of life. John's baptism didn't save them. Faith in the coming Lamb of God who would give his shed blood is what saved them. Mm -hmm. Okay, did I finish your question? I think so. Okay, because so I've got so many different <laughs> friends going, I'm afraid I'm dropping something. Um, Anne, go ahead. Uh, in, in the word, when it refers to the law, is it referring to the Ten Commandments or all 360, Six, whatever? 613. <laughs> yeah, that, that, like that. The Ten Commandments are the start. There's When they get into the 613, they've taken in the laws that give them the ceremonial laws in regard to what their temple work and all of that. Obviously, those can't even be kept today because there's no temple. That's why they say, well, they're adhering to all the law that, that is there today. But nowhere does God say, keep the ten and you're okay. He says, keep the law. The law had a lot more than just the ten. Uh, the ten are almost know. like major categories, but still, some of them aren't because, like I say, they're, they're ceremonial in the temple. Go ahead. Um, I've always been a little fuzzy as to specifically what the word is referring to when it says the law. I know it's the Ten Commandments, the law. but I'm not... I, we, are we at fault in, in witnessing and not understanding what we're, you know, getting a complete grasp of what it is that they're feeling they need to keep if, when they talk if, law? If you are telling them that if you haven't kept the Ten Commandments, you're guilty before God, that's fine. Because who's kept the Ten Commandments, let alone? The 603 other, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> let alone. So, no, you're not at fault and you're not wrong. But if they were to happen to try to say, well, I have kept every single one of those 10, then ask them, well, what about the 603 others? What about the ones that have to do with everything ceremonially? And they'll use the excuse, well, we don't have the temple. Okay, well, where does God say you have to keep all the law only while you have the temple? He doesn't give room for that. You know, and, and all of these laws that, that are being given are more than just those 10. The 10 are are great and a lot are incorporated under them but you have the laws of, uh, of having to make the, the the blood sacrifice okay the well, life uh, leviticus 17 11 is law leviticus 17 11. okay for the life of the flesh is in the blood i've given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls there's your yom kippur yom kippur day of atonement there's your atonement but notice the second part of the verse, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So how can they do anything other than shedding blood to get an atonement? There is no other way. That's out of the law, okay, because this is part of the law. So you don't read that in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt make a sacrifice of blood unto the Lord for forgiveness of sin, but that's part of the law. 
the whole, so you know it's not just keeping 10 it's keeping 613. Then, Do you think they bring up the chicken at that point? They might. The Orthodox who do it might. But then I'll ask them, where does God say we get to substitute a chicken? And what about putting that blood on the mercy seat? See, it's they're, they're making their own rules. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. I want to be sure, be clear on this in case I'm challenged with. That's, that's fine. And we all need to be clear. Rhonda, I think you're on the same subject. She's trying. She's trying. Roger's trying to. There we go. Okay. Does does Leviticus five seventeen still count? It says, if a person sins and commits any of these things, which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. Does that fall under that? That's excellent. What what was that? Five seventeen. Yeah, Leviticus 5, 7, 10. Okay, that's an excellent one to bring out. Yes, it does fall in that because this is part of the law. That's why I'm saying the law is a lot more than just the Ten Commandments. Yes, yeah, that's excellent. If a soul sinned, now right there they're going to say, oh, but I haven't sinned. Okay, then where have you done this and this and this and that that God has said? You know, go through here. Pull out more than just those, those Ten Commandments. Um Okay, and then you, you already read it. You know, they're, they're forbidden. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to jump into the verse, and I can't. If a soul sin, commit any of those things that are forbidden to be done by the commandments. Then he know that he knows is not, yet he is guilty, and he shall bear his iniquity. So even if they don't know it, they're guilty of not keeping it. That's what's being said. That's why you have some of the prayers that they do pray. That, that like Cole and the Dre, all these vows, whatever I've done, said I would do and I didn't do or I don't realize, we call them today sins of omission and sins of commission. Commission are the sins we know we're doing, sins of omission are the sins that we don't even realize that we've not done right. Okay, so yes, that's an excellent verse. Even if you don't know all the, 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 the law, you're still guilty if you're not keeping it. God's standard is 100% perfect. And really, even those who don't want to say that they've ever sinned, if you can get them to that point where they can understand, you have to live every day of your life perfect to be on God's holy standard. Otherwise, you haven't hit it up here. That means that you're guilty of sin. Yeah. But again, it's only the Holy Spirit can really convict that heart and bring that truth. It's one of the hardest places, especially for someone who does try to be a good person and does try to do good deeds and, and all of that. But, uh, but have they lived every day of their life perfectly, never did anything wrong, never stepped a foot out of line, always did everything God's commanded us to do? You know, that's all. And, and their answer should be, well, nobody can do that. Right. Now you're getting it. <laughs> exactly. It's not that you have to be a bad, bad person. Remember the white poster board? It can have just a pinpoint. But that's it. That pinpoint will keep you out of heaven. That pinpoint breaks your relationship with a holy God. Yes, Roger. I can't, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, one of the Bible verses where it talks about... Um, a guy on a, on a horse and he's riding and the apostle comes up to him and he, God sends it to him to talk to him about the... Philip the and the Ethiopian eunuch? Yeah, that one. Okay. And he talks about he about not sinning and going into heaven and that he's not sinned since his youth. Remember that one? That's what I'm trying to find. Okay, that, Acts 7 is the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's see if if you've got it all in one or if you're I'm doing running. something. Yeah, I'm not sure because I haven't read it recently. Okay, Philip ran to him. He heard him reading. That he heard, this is the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip was suddenly deposited where, where this, this Ethiopian was in his chariot reading Isaiah. And Philip comes up alongside him and says, do you understand what you're reading? In verse 31 of chapter uh, 8, I'm sorry, I said 7, chapter 8 of Acts. Um, 
his, the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he asked Philip that he would come up and sit with him. In other words, hey, if you're asking me if I understand, do you understand? Can you help me? Come up here. Help me. The place in scriptures where he read was, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, like a lamb done before his shear, he opened up his mouth. That's Isaiah 53. We just read that earlier. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray you, who does the prophet speak of, of himself, of Isaiah, or of some other man? Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Yeshua. He said, no, he's not speaking about himself. He's not speaking about another human being. He's speaking about Yeshua. So, and they went on their way, and by that point, the eunuch is believing, and he sees that he needs to be baptized to show his heart change. That's where we see what baptism means today, and so we ask Philip, he says, there's water here, what's to stop me from getting baptized now? And Philip said, if you're believing with your whole heart, then yes, you can be baptized. See, it's a heart conviction, it's a heart change. And he answered and said, I believe that Yeshua HaMashiach is the Son of God. Remember how he said they have to believe in that deity? Remember that's what Paul said? They have to be, believe that the Lord is God. If they believe that the Lord is just a good man, if that can't save them, a man teacher, can't save them, a, a good teacher, a good rabbi. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to call a rabbi good who claims to be God unless he is God. You know, that's not good if he's not. If he is, we better pay attention to him. So I don't think that gave what you wanted there. I think I think you're putting something else together. It must be, yeah, because I'm not seeing it either. Okay, and what's your what's the other part? I don't even remember. Well, that. there was. Um, I'm gonna have to keep looking it up though. But it, it was talking about a rich man, not Lazarus and that one, but a rich man where he was. He told him to sell all your goods. Yeah. And follow me, and he and went away sad because. Because he said he hadn't since since his youth. Yes, that's the rich young ruler. Yeah. Yes, that's the rich young ruler. That's in the Gospels. Let me Google because it's not coming fast enough. It's going to be in a couple of them. Probably Luke is where we're going to want to go. Let me try real fast. Rich young ruler. And God called, the Lord called him out. Yeah, it is in Luke. Hmm. Um, let's just do this one. And, okay, it's in Matthew and it's in Mark. Why did it say Luke? Uh, Mark 10. Okay, yeah, Mark 10, we'll go to that one because Mark's concise, so I think for our point today, and this could be a good point, but now you can't be bringing up Mark to the Orthodox Jew who doesn't believe in the what we call the New Covenant, the B'rach HaDashah. So Mark isn't a scripture I can use when I'm sharing with my Jewish brethren unless they're ready to look and see that this does complete our scriptures. Because, and again, and I, and I heard it today, and it always just grieves my heart. You do not have two Bibles. You don't have two books. You don't have the Jewish side and then the Christian side. Please, nobody say that. If you're saying it in just, make sure that they know that you're laughing in just. It is one complete book, one complete story. It is the story of our Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, in relation to Israel from the original, all the way into the Brit Shah. But you can't divide it that way, and you can't say it, because as soon as you do, you're feeding our Jewish people who say, yeah, those books aren't for us. That's the, the Christian God. That's not the Jewish God. Mm -hmm. Well, the Jewish God, we see prophesied in the original, and we see revealed in the Brit Shah. He lived it out. It was, it was recorded and put down for us in the books written by these good Jewish boys. Matthew was Jewish. Mark was Jewish. Luke, I think he was a Jew type. Even if you want to argue that, John was Jewish. The ones who recorded what our, our Yeshua Jesus did were Jewish. And Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience telling his Jewish people, go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews has got to be for the Hebrews. Hello? <laughs> Would you call it something, you know, if it, if it wasn't for the Hebrews? And what does it do? It tells them all the way through. What you have in your original, you have the blood of bulls and goats. Now you've got better blood. 
you've got the house that Moshe built. Now you've got the house that God built, that Yeshua actually built. Everything compare and contrast to show this is the greater, the better. Go on with this. This is it. And Dora lit up. Yes, the key word for the book of Hebrews is better. Better. Better, <laughs> better everything. And especially take them to 8, 9, and 10 of the book of Hebrews if they'll look at it because that sums it all up. It's where I want to go with them on Yom Kippur. Here's my atonement. Here's the blood put on the, and I've already said it today, the greater high priest, Yeshua, who put it on the mercy seat in the heavenlies. This one on earth was patterned after the heavenlies. He took his blood straight to the, to the, the uh, mercy seat of the original in the presence of a holy God, which is why heaven was now opened up. That's why when you die today, a believer, you go into the presence of God and not into Sheol because that way was now made open. The blood was on the mercy seat in the heaven to proclaim our liberty and freedom. Our sins washed away. We get to go into the presence of a living God. That's why they went into the heart of the earth before that because the blood hadn't been put on the mercy seat yet in the heavens. And the only thing that can enter into heaven is perfect, sinless. So there's your better. There's my soapbox. <laughs> yes, Sam. Um, just, just a suggestion. One, one way that you can show that the um, Red Hot Shah is, is a continuation of the Tanakh is that the very first chapter is the lineage, which it's like it's verifying. Okay, what you're about to read is about it's this person. Still Jewish. <laughs> yes. Now he's so intimately tied up yes. with everything. Yes. Came. Yes. I love it. And I've said it many a time. And thank you for making me bring it out clearly today. Absolutely. When you want to share with them, and many of our Jewish people who were not yet believers took a sneak peek and looked at Matthew. And one even had the audacity to say, What's my ancestry doing in your book? <laughs> See, that's why it's not a Christian book. Does it present? The one called Christ, yes, but remember what's Christ mean? Anointed one. What does Messiah mean? Anointed one. So you can take your English Bible and everywhere that you read the word Christ from Matthew to Revelation, you could cross it out and write the word Messiah and be right. You don't have to cross it out, but I mean, that's what the word. And if we use the word that they need to hear rather than the word that's that's anglicized rather than use the word that to them well I've heard that word Christ the crusaders put up a cross and said bow down to Christ or it's off with your head and they took the, the it's off with my head because I won't bow before another God thou shalt have no other gods before me that's why we don't like to use the word Christ when we're sharing with an unsaved Jewish person who does not know and understand what that word Christ means now, sometimes they get enlightened, and they do begin to see and understand, and then you can use it. But if you're trying to share with somebody, use the term from the Hebrew, because the Christ is the English of Christos, which is the Greek, which is the equivalent of Mashiach, Messiah, which is the Hebrew. So that's why I'll refer to it that way. That's why you hear me say Jewish terms for you all the time, so that you can begin to have that in your mind when you're sharing with a Jewish person. They don't know the terminology from English necessarily, but they'll recognize some of those Jewish words and we want to share with them. And yes, to get all excited, you have the book of the genealogy of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. I just read you Matthew 1.1. I didn't even get to the end of one because the end of the first verse says he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. Whoa, wait a minute. To all our good Jewish people who have good Jewish minds, wait a minute. You're talking about my granddaddy. You know, he might be a great, 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 but that one's mine. How does that one tie in with this one that's supposed to be the Christian God? How do those two go together in the first verse? And it goes on and approves it because he tells you who Abraham begot and who Yitzhak begot. And it goes all the way down. Before you get to what, verse 14, you're into Yeshua? No, a little further than 14. You get Yeshua coming in um, about 18, starts to come in. But anyway, it follows it all the way through. You've got the whole Jewish genealogy. 
So yes, it is a great way to show our Jewish people when they're ready, look, let's not be afraid of that book. It's really not a Christian book, especially when Christian is equated with non-Jewish. So it's, it's the Crusaders, it's Hitler, and, and all the rest. Let's get away from that lie and let's embrace what's the truth. And as they begin to open up by the Ruch HaKodesh giving them the light, to the truth, they'll begin to see and understand. Uh, there was, uh, and his, Zola Levitz, it's in his family, his son-in-law, mm, one of the ones that worked with him, maybe it wasn't a relative, but one of the ones that worked with his ministry, he's a great ministry, anything that Zola Levitt put out in literature that you come across, great tools for how to share with your Jewish people, he had the Jewish background. Anyway, Jeffrey Seif, that was his name. I uh, think he might even still be alive today. He's living in Chicago. He's six years old. He's walking down the sidewalk to go home from school. And one of the, the house, you know, one of the apartments way up, somebody yells out the window, get off my sidewalk, you dirty Jew, you Christ killer. He's six years old. He went home to his dad and he said, who is Christ? They said, I killed him. He was so confused, and his dad, who had had some experience in life, said, oh, that's what these Christians believe. And he said to his son, and it stuck with his son, who did come to believe. I hope the father did too, I don't know, but it stuck with his son, even at six years of age. He says, you know, six days a week, they hate us, and then on the seventh day, they go worship one of us. Go figure. <laughs> If you don't get that, they're worshiping Jesus in their churches on Sundays and they are worshiping who they love, not realizing and accepting and believing Jesus is a Jew. So if you're hating the Jews during the week, you're hating Jesus. How can you do that? And you can't. You can't. That's part of what we have to fight against. And that's why when I hear Christ killer, it just... Well, I've said enough. I don't want to stay on my soap opera. Soap opera. <laughs> soap box. <laughs> too long. <laughs> yes, Sam, go ahead. And uh, Rhonda. That, that's, I'm going to remember that. That's very powerful. Oh. It, it reminds me uh, of uh, one of the folks that's up top of Jews for Jesus said that he was, uh, he just handed uh, a New Testament to a Jewish non believing young man. And he came back and he said, Nobody told me this was such a Jewish book. He said, have, I love this. He said, have the rabbis seen this? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And see, that fits with my dad, who after he got saved, right after, and he is so excited over his salvation. He's got all that initial enthusiasm. He's in love with Yeshua Jesus. And then all of a sudden, he gets, um, and it was Isaiah 53. And it's like, no, that's not in our Jewish Bible. Because if it were, I would have known this. And, and even aside from my dad's testimony, there were kids in the public school system who went home one day. When this was after um, they were told that they couldn't talk about Jesus you know, in the classroom, but they could read the Bible. And the teacher would read scripture every day to her young children. And she read one day, and the, the kids ran home and said, Mommy, Mommy, teacher read from the New Testament today. That was a no-no. Mm -hmm. So... Mom's all upset, goes down to the principal, the principal calls the teacher in on the carpet and says, I understand you read out of the New Testament today, and the teachers opened up and said, this is what I read, and read it there also, and it was Isaiah 53. And here's my dad saying, wow, there's no way this is in our Jewish Bible. The Christians are lying to me. Now this that I thought was so great, I'm finding out it's not great, it's going to all collapse, and he was heartbroken. He didn't want to lose what he had just gained. But he had that he could not believe it was in the Jewish Bible. So he raced down to the library to get a hold of a Jewish Bible. And he pulled out the Jerusalem Bible, printed in Jerusalem. This is a Bible that's accepted by our Jewish people. And he would tell the story. He said, with shaking hands, I pulled it down off the shelf, stood right there, opened it up, and read for myself in the Jerusalem Bible, Isaiah 53. Elated and relieved, it is in his Jewish Bible, a moment later, turns to anger. Why have the rabbis kept this from our people? Why are they not telling us about it? 
Well, they skip it because it's controversial. They don't want to explain it. They, they, it. they can't explain it. No. They can't. They try to say it's the nation of Israel. Put the nation of Israel in there. Go read it for yourself. I've challenged Jewish yet to believe people to do that. And not one of them has come back and said, yeah, Israel fits. They've all said, no, you're right. It doesn't fit. When, when my dad was working with Rabbi Maurice Levy, who came to faith, they went through all the, the scriptures for their lessons. So what scriptures do you think my dad chose? He chose the prophetic scriptures. And as they came along and they were reading Isaiah 53 together, Maurice said to my dad, I can see why the Christians say this speaks of Jesus. See, he'd heard. He could see. He got it. And my dad asked him, well, who do you say it speaks of? And he turned really red and he just said, I don't know. But two weeks later, when my dad was coming for his lesson, he flew open the door and said, I can no longer refute my scriptures. I'm ready to receive my Messiah. And he was oh, born again. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, these are the tools that we use. This is what Paul is saying. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah is telling us, and yet Isaiah himself is crying out and saying, Who has believed our report? Pray for them to have the faith to believe. Rhonda, I don't want to leave you out. We're muted again. Uh, uh, love hate relationship with Zoom. <laughs> okay. No, I was just going to share. I remember about uh, 20 years ago, I was at a beauty shop and there was a lady I was small talking with next to me. She was Jewish. And I just said, um, I don't know how, we, how this came up, but I said, well, a true Christian um, loves the Jewish people. And she was quiet. She turned to me and she said, why did you say that? I said, because our Savior is Jewish. But I remember her quietness. She never said another word. It was like, it was like she never knew that. Right. And um, right. you don't have to know your preacher. And sometimes you can just give a little tidbit. And I, I like Absolutely. to believe that she went on with life and researched that. Absolutely. Do I believe you planted a seed or watered somebody else's seed that they planted? Absolutely. And that yeah. as she pondered on that, God would bring her more light and more light to bring her to the truth. Very rarely does a Jewish person get everything said to them in one sitting and accept it all and accept the Lord. That's, that's really rare, but it's a process. It's a process, and that was a great response, and that... That even is what I was able, in a way, to share with our rabbi recently in L.A. when he brought up that word Christian. And I said, you know, a true Christian loves. A true Christian is not the one that has persecuted you in this name. That's, that doesn't go together. But they don't know. They, are, they really don't know. And sadly, honestly, there's so many Gentiles out there that have no idea Jesus is Jewish hmm. that they don't even bring it out either. You know, but the Jewishness is there, and that's why I will ask my Jewish brethren, how can I believe in a Jewish God and now be told I'm not Jewish? That doesn't work. If I accept all the Jewish scriptures speaking about my Jewish God, how does that make me not Jewish? And oh, by the way, then when did you become Jewish? If you're born it, you're going to die it no matter what you do in between. Anyway, we're, this, this is all good. I hope it's been a blessing, but I want to get us back into Romans. Did you have something, Anne, still? Just real quick. that um, Isaiah was either the first or one of the first whole books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and it was one of the only ones found in its entirety. Yes, yes. I just love that. Yes. It's like Hashem preserved it for reference. Absolutely. Absolutely. The scriptures have been preserved for that, but that in its entirety, it does speak volumes. And the only differences in our Isaiah today and that that was um, discovered by, from the scenes from that time um, are four punctuation marks. That's the only difference. That's not anything that changes a meaning. It's not even like a, it doesn't change a period, a question mark, or anything like that. It was just, there's all kinds of little markings with the Hebrew. And probably those four the discrepancies even could be found out why they were what they were. But it had no bearing on the words, no bearing on the sentences, no bearing on the meaning. 
and you can see it to this day in Israel on display, uh, behind glass, but yes, yes. Yeah. Miracle. Yes, yes, but you know, that's what we have the, to thank the Jews for, and Paul says it, um, and we'll hit that when we get back to Romans 11, is they have the oracles of God. They've passed us down the very word of God. They preserved it for us, and many of them preserved it at the cost of the, their lives. There are many Torah scrolls that are covered with blood from the Holocaust because the person holding them gave their life to, to save the scriptures. It is the holy word of God, and that is the value. So as we come back into Romans uh, 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Messiah. I'm sorry? I said I love Romans. Oh, yes. So Romans is a wonderful book. Yeah. It's a wonderful book. Um, I think I covered 17. I, I think I've said it well. Most of the best manuscripts say the word of Christ, the word of the anointed one, the word of Messiah. Some will say the word of God. It's still it's a little more accurate from the original um, manuscripts that we have to, to see it as Messiah, but we know Messiah is God. So if you have that, don't throw your Bible out. Verse 18, but I say surely they have never heard. Have they? That's a rhetorical question. Is they haven't heard this? It's more like we would say they have failed to hear it. Remember he's saying they need to hear. They need to hear. You know, we, we all know times when we're talking to people and they're not hearing a word we're saying. <laughs> okay? They need to hear. How did they hear? Okay? Because here's Paul's answer. On the contrary, I can't say they've never heard because their voice, the voice of the gospel, has gone out to all of the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Okay, how has it gone out? The way it's gone out should be fresh in our minds because of our study just prior to this. Let me take you to Psalm 19 and verse 4. Oops, my tablet's acting up. Actually, it's my fingers acting up. Psalm 19 and verse 4. I'll back you up to verse 1, but 4 is our key verse for, for right now because we're talking about it going to the ends of the earth. And verse 4 says, Their line has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Okay, so Paul is saying the words that they should have heard have gone to the end of the world. Well, what words are we talking about? Well, let's back up to verses 1 through 3 to understand verse 4. The heavens tell of the glory of God, or the heavens declare the glory of God. Remember, they're narrating, they're telling, they're telling the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Hebrews 1, 3 says the glory of God is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, that he is express image. He is the very glory. He is the Shekhinah of our God. So the heavens are declaring Messiah. Remember Isaiah declared Messiah would be the sin offering. This was made clear, but they weren't hearing and they weren't following. Now Shaul Paul is saying, They've had it, they, this word has gone out. They're without excuse. They can't say, well, they've never heard it. The whole heavens are declaring it. The expanse declares the work of God's hands. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words or voices not heard. Then it says that a lion has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In other words, they're not doing verbal words. It's not that the sun's up there talking like you and I are talking and the stars are talking at night, but they are telling the story. They are declaring. They are narrating. It is, and it has gone out through creation. Creation alone has revealed God, has revealed Yeshua who created to, uh, to whosoever. So back in Romans chapter 10 and verse I think we're still in 18 I think I think I want to break down 18 a little bit more and I've got to get out there we go I always go back to chapter 9 uh, 18 yeah okay so I, so let me break it down a little more what he's saying when he says on the contrary or you may have indeed that's saying most certainly their voice the word of God has gone out the voice that's saying hear the words of the of messiah in verse 17 by faith they need to hear it and that voice or that sound literally from the greek what it's talking about is vibration like a musical string 
you know how you can pluck a string and you hear the music? It's like that. You pluck a star, you're hearing their music. That's what he's saying. Creation is singing the glory of God. We know that in its divine design, that those who are honest with creation say it shows a master designer. That leads you to a creator. So this has gone out to the ends of the world, to all the extremities, the ends of the world as they knew it at that time, the ends of the world as we know it today. Go with me quickly to Colossians. Colossians 1, um, we're going to read the end of verse 5, we'll go into verse 6, and we'll drop down to verse 23 also. Uh, I may have some verses in between, but Colossians 1, the end of verse 5, is saying, You previously heard in the word of truth the gospel. How? Verse 6, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So creation's been declaring this all along, is what he's saying, that that's part of how the word of the truth has gone out. Um, drop down, I want to remind you, verses 15, 16, 17, 18 are telling us, that Yeshua, Jesus, was the creator. When we see in the beginning God created, we don't have a problem because when we look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew says in the beginning God's created, singular verb. Elohim is God's. El would have been God. What is being told in the beginning is that both God the Father and God the Son were involved in creation. And furthermore, verse 2 lets us know the Spirit of God wasn't missing either. He hovered. He was, he was brooding like a mama hen broods over her chicks over the face of the earth. So we see the triunity of God involved in creation. So we're seeing that creation created, uh, creation speaks the story of the creator who is Messiah. There's no problem with that. It's not just God the Father who created. Um, and verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly and establish steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which was proclaimed in all of creation under heaven. Okay, creation's declaring it. Everywhere you look, it's declaring it. From the gospel and the stars that I've given you to what's on the earth, you look at the, the majesticness of the flower. The design of the flower speaks to you of a divine creator. Look at the fishies in the sea. Look at the variety. Look at the designs. How did that all happen? From slime on a riverbank that went bang and suddenly was male and female so it could reproduce and it reproduces only after its kind. And yet we've got so many varieties. I don't know how many varieties of fishies and doggies and kitties and, and whatever you want to name. And the, and the flowers and the trees. I mean, come on. It takes more faith to believe that that evolutionized into a form that follows a pattern today that didn't before then it does to believe that God created and that God is also Jesus and this is what creation is showing us and that's why people that say well it's not fair if they're born in the jungles they didn't get to hear the testimony they didn't get to go to a church on the corner it's not fair that God condemns them and God will say they have all of creation around them to show them. And if they would have come to that light, I would have given them more light. And I can give you testimony after testimony after testimony proving that to be true. Even as I fully believe the one that Rhonda shared with me and was able to give that seed to, God would follow up. And there'd be another time when that person was ready to receive more and God would continue on. He's not willing that any should perish. With that in mind, we go back to... Well, the world at that time was an inhabited world. I think I already said that. It would have been the Roman kingdom. Today we know the world to be much larger. It's still, when it's saying the world, it means the entire world. Matthew 24 and verse 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, don't jump in there and out of context say, Oh, the Lord can't return because the gospel hasn't gone to the ends of the earth. What this is talking about is his second coming. And his second coming will come after the gospel has been taken by 144,000 evangelists to the ends of the earth. 
So there is no problem here. It's not rapture talk. This is second coming. And besides that fact, creation's gone to the ends of the earth since creation began. It's not that it unfolded little by little. It's not that it developed as it went along. Suddenly we got a sun. Suddenly we got stars. Oh, just perfect timing. We've got carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide to balance, which is balanced, we know, by the trees and the green and all of that and by the humans. But that just happened to evolve at the right time to have the balance so that one or the other didn't die because it was lacking the other. Very interesting. Verse 19. We'll get more into creation when we get back into uh, um, Bereshit, Genesis, which we will get there. <laughs> okay, verse 19. But I say, surely Israel did not know. Did they? Here's another one of his questions. Did Israel fail to know? If if we looked at that first question, which was, what was the first question? I'm sorry, my mind is spinning. Um, oh, the first question was, but I say, surely they've not heard, have they? Of course they have. So here in the same way, I say, surely Israel didn't know, did they? Did Israel not know? Did Israel fail to know? And again, the construction of the sentence is an obvious negative answer, no. They, they, they cannot say that they did not know. That knowing here, that word for know here, is meaning a knowledge is gained by experience so that you understand what is known. This, this is, you know, it, it, you experience it, okay? So did they have a chance? Did they know? Were they able to experience? Absolutely. First Moshe, Moses says, I will make you jealous with those who are not a nation, with a foolish nation, I will anger you. Okay, what's being said? First of all, it's a quote from Davarim from Deuteronomy 32, verses 17 to 21. It's important that you see this and know this. I'm going to take you back there because those words were written by Moshe. That's back again, 1400 BC. That's not at the time when the church has been uh, birthed the church is birthed in, I'm going to just round it, okay? This is not exact, just rounding it. Let's just say 40 A.D., okay? We know Messiah was more like about 33 A.D. when, when he was crucified. So I'll say 35 A.D., okay? So if you've got 1400 B.C. and 35 years on the A.D. side, you're talking almost 1500 years. You're talking over 1400 years anyway. Difference in time. So... You cannot read the church into Moses. It wasn't there, okay? The church isn't born until Messiah has died on the cross, raised from the dead, spent 40 days on this earth, ascended into heaven 10 days later on Shavuot, what's called Pentecost by the church people today. That's the Greek word. Shavuot is the Hebrew ceremony. You have the Holy Spirit coming down. You have the, he come like the tongues of fire on the heads of the apostles who are able to speak in languages that they have not studied. Notice how those are known languages. They were able to, to uh, speak the gospel in the language that the Jews who had all come up to be obedient to God were hearing now in their own language and saying, wow, I can understand John. Well, I understand Thomas. I understand Peter. I understand James. Wow, what a message they're telling. And thankfully, even though it's small in comparison, about 3,000 came to believe on that day, and then they took it back to their homes when they went back. Wonderful way to, to splash, boom, get, get the church going. But that's when the church was born. So keep the church out of um, going back here to Deuteronomy. We're going to go back there. Deuteronomy 32, 17 to 21. Deuteronomy, Davarim, 32, and we will read starting with verse 17. In verse 17, we read, They sacrificed to demons who were not God. Okay, who's the they? Moshe's talking about the children of Israel. He's actually 
prophesying, what they're going to do. He knows his time is about over. He's talking to them like a good father, trying to tell them what they need to do, and they need to stay obedient before God. And if they do, they will receive blessing. And if they don't, they'll receive the curses that God has warned them about. And even in spite of that, he basically says, yet I know you're going to blow it. I know you're going to go idolatry. I know you're going to turn away from God. And they're going to sacrifice to these demons, to these idols who were not God, the gods whom they've not known, new gods who came lately by the people that they should have wiped out and instead they let them live and they brought in their idolatry. These were gods that your fathers didn't know. Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov didn't know. You forgot the rock who fathered you. Remember the rock was a picture of Yeshua, the picture of God in this case, the one who, who birthed you, who gave you life. It's God the Father and God the Son. You forgot the God who gave you birth. Um, verse 19, how far do I want to read to 21? Okay, the Lord saw this and spurned them. The Lord got angry with them because they're worshiping idols, because of the provocation by his sons and his daughters. These are his kids. These are the children of Israel. Now, anywhere in here where you see where God says, I cut them off, they're no longer my son, they're no longer my daughter, you show that to me. But I'm not reading that. I read he's angry with his children. You, any of you parents out there ever get angry at your kids when they're blowing it royally and not listening to you? <laughs> and God's anger is righteous anger, okay? It's not mistaken. Because of that, he says, then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. If I had my face, I'm going to see what happens to them. Now, again, did he say, I'm going to cut them off, I'm done with them? No, he says, I'm going to hide, okay? You don't want to worship me? I'm going to hide from you for a little bit. We'll see what happens. Because this is a perverse generation. Sons in whom there's no faithfulness, and God is huge. Faithfulness is everything with God. Verse 21, they have made me jealous with what is not God. He's jealous for his people. You're loving that idol. You're worshiping that idol. I want you to love me. I want you to worship me. I'm the one that gave you life. I'm the one that, that, that's doing everything for you. They provoke me to anger with their idols. So what am I going to do about it? Done. Wipe them out. Raise up the church. Do I see anybody saying no? Hello? <laughs> Please no one believe that. That's not what's being said here. He doesn't say that at all. He says, I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now, we just heard that phrase, jealous with those who are not a people. That's what Paul is drawing on. We're going to go back to that in Romans in just a moment. But I want you all to hear this so clearly. He never says he's going to cut them off. He says, I'm going to make you want me. I'm going to hide from you, and I'm going to let you see what those idols really are doing for you. I'm going to let you see what you miss, because not only am I going to hide from you while you're off doing your idolatry, but I'm going to pick up another people, and I'm going to lavish on them what I want to give to you that you won't receive from me. And when you see that happen, what are you going to do? That was mine. I want it. I want you, God. Good. I'm yours. <laughs> That's what I want. Come to me. My arms are open. We're going to read it, and we're not going to get there, I don't think, because it's the end of chapter 10. We're going to read all the day long his arms were open to reach out to an obstinate nation. So just keep that in mind when we come to it. I'll get you in just a minute, Pam. But let me take you back into uh, Romans uh, to where, where it was said that he's going to raise up another people. He's going to turn to another nation. He's going to love them. He's going to bring them in. And in doing that, I will make you jealous. If you're making somebody jealous, you're wanting them. Okay? Bad thing to do. But if you're a boy or a girl and you want to make another, you, you're a boy and you want to make your girl jealous, you pay attention to another girl. Girls play the game with other boys. I'll pay attention oh, yes. to another boy to get you to want to pay attention to me. Well, God's not just playing a game, but that's what he basically was doing, was making them jealous. Not done with them, making them want him. He's going to use a foolish nation 
to anger them. Now, does that mean that Gentiles are fools? No. No, that's not what God is saying. They're foolish people who do not have God for their God. That's what's being said. It's the heathen ways, it's the adulterous ways that are foolish. If they remained a foolish people, they wouldn't turn to God either. But they're going to turn from that foolishness, and they're going to come to believe in God, and that will make je Israel jealous. And guess what? It is coming really close, and I'm going to scoot for it because I can even see it on my screen. Let me see if I gave you everything I needed to. Moses said it. He's going to make them jealous. And by the way, let me make it clear. He's going to give salvation to the Gentiles. We said that earlier today, that the Gentile gets saved the same way as the Jew now. They weren't going to have to come in as a proselyte anymore. And he's going to arouse in Israel that same desire to come straight to him to be their God. Okay? So he's making them jealous on the basis of a people that's not a nation, that doesn't have the heritage with God. That's the Gentiles. They didn't have the heritage that with God. They didn't have an Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This is what it's talking about. The nation that is without understanding. That's why they're called foolish too. They didn't have an understanding of the true God. I will provoke you to anger. I'll provoke you to be full of wrath. I will anger you because Israel, up until this time, claimed and rightfully so the monopoly on salvation. You had to come through the nation of Israel to come into that faith of the true God of Israel, the one true and living God. Moshe and Isaiah, Yeshia, both tell our people that there's going to be salvation to the Gentiles to make you jealous. He, this was God's plan A. It was not plan B because his people rejected. And so then he gives how they said it. And I can do this quickly. Isaiah is very bold. This is verse 20. Isaiah is very bold and says, he speaks out boldly. He, he declared he was very daring. And he says it in Isaiah 65 and verse 1, yet we have it quoted here. I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Remember, the Gentile nations are the heathen nations, the idolatrous nations. They're not seeking for God but yet, because Israel won't pay attention to him, God's going to reveal himself to people that aren't even seeking him. And he's going to, to, to turn to people who aren't asking for him, but he's going to freely give himself. So that Gentile that's been in idolatry, when God reveals himself to him and they come into salvation without having to do it through the nation of Israel, and, and they see that, and they see that that Gentile has picked up what... God was doing with them and what God had given to them. Now they're going to be provoked to jealousy. Remember, I've given you the example before. You've got a child in a room playing with a ton of toys and the child's happily playing. He goes to the other side of the room and he's playing contentedly over there. In comes a new child. The child picks up just one toy and starts to play with it. And what so often will happen, and I'm talking like on a two-year-old level, but what so often will happen is that two-year-old that was first in the room and contentedly playing on the other side, looks and sees that new one pick up something that he had thought was his, claimed to be his, but he had dropped it to go play with something else. Israel dropped their God to go play with the heathen gods. Oh, wait a minute. And that two-year-old makes it all the way across as fast as he can to the other side of the room and goes up to that child and pulls that toy out of their hands and says, mine. Remember? They're born with that nature. <laughs> That's what God's saying. I'm going to make you Israel look back and say, that was mine. I want it. And the beautiful part is God's going to say, good, you can both have it. He's got a way that, that he is bringing in Jew and Gentile equally together. That's what's coming on our Jewish calendar in time. Um, Actually, it's the wrong time of the year, sorry. But it, it's seen in Shavuot, not Sukkot, it's in Shavuot, the two wave looks that are offered to the Lord that look identical, Jew and Gentile, coming together. This follows right after Pesach, right after the blood was put on the Tomit Sea, the veil opened between the Holy of Holies and the Most Holy Place. 
I said it in reverse, I'm trying to hurry. Anyway, to that mercy seat so that the blood could be placed on that altar, could be seen. That blood was there on the mercy seat that God had made the way into his presence, now open for Jew and Gentile alike. That's what's happening. It's not a cutting off. It's not a, a I'm done with you. You blew it. We're going to deal with that extensively next week in our verses. But here he's revealing himself now to the Gentile and yet makes it very, very clear. Verse 21, but as for Israel, he says, I have spread out my hands all day long to a disobedient and an obstinate people. What does it look like when you spread out your hands? I'm going to show you in two ways. The first way is like this, and he gave his life on the cross for their salvation. But the second way is he's saying, come, come, come. Have you ever seen a daddy get down on his knees when his little one is across the room and he's saying, come? You ever been in an airport when the daddy's been gone and comes home and you see that little child going 90 miles an hour running into daddy's arms and daddy throws his arms around him? Let me take you to the prodigal son who happened to be Jewish, by the way. <laughs> and the father's looking for him every day when he finally sees him coming. The father pulls up his robe, which they didn't do for dignity's sake in those days, but he's, who cares about dignity? That's my son, and runs to meet his son, threw his arms around his son, put his robe on his son, brought his son into his house fed him, clothed him, brought him in. That's a picture of God the Father, not rejecting Israel, but trying to provoke them to jealousy that they will run into his open arms that he's had open all the day long. He has not cut his arms off from Israel. His arms are not cut short that he cannot save all the day long. This is incessant, pleading, loving, pouring out a heart of love to disobedient people that are so obstinate. It was obstinate, it's willful disobedience. It's, I want it my way. And as soon as you want to blame that on just the Jews, I'll tell you, tell you dear Gentiles, look out. Because you, he who lives in, in glass houses should not throw stones. Anyway, um, the obstinate people, if you have gained saying that's obstinate, non-persuadable, willful disobedient. And then if you have the word gained saying that's also contrary, to oppose oneself, to decline to obey, to declare oneself against them, to refuse to have anything to do with them, to be cantankerous. That's who Israel's been. And God doesn't say, enough, I'm done. He keeps his arms out all the day long. He wants to welcome them in. He wants to bring them in. And he's doing all he can to provoke them to jealousy. And chapter 11, verse 1, where we're ending it right now, says, Because Israel rejected God, has God rejected Israel? Amen. That's Paul's next question. Remember his other questions and the way it was phrased? I say that God has not rejected his people, has he? It's only a temporary sidetracking in the way that salvation's being given to the world that he might bring in the fullness of the Gentiles, the other people that he has, that he's using this other nation who was foolish because they didn't know God, brings them the light of the truth so they come out of their foolishness. They now know the God of Israel and, and the Jew is going to look and see that the Gentiles come into what he has and want it for himself also. That's where we're at. We'll see that when we pick up in chapter 11 next week. Verse 25 of 11 says, I don't want you, brothers and sisters, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you're wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Key words, partial until. Partial means it's not a complete, there's not a complete cutting off, and it's until a certain time. God in his majestic, that's not the right word, how, how brilliant his mind is, so brilliant that he figured a way to bring salvation to Jew and Gentile. This is his perfect plan. He's never done with Israel. He's never done with the church. If he cuts off and keep, doesn't keep his word with Israel, 
Church, get worried, but I guarantee you, you'll never see it. And we say, hallelujah, all the day long. What chapter was that on our prayer were you? I just finished with 11, 1, but it's where oh. I'll pick up. Oh, okay. Romans 11, okay. verse 1, yeah. I read through the end, the last um, 20 and 21 of chapter 10, and went into 11, Romans 11, verse 1. Because remember, it wasn't written with chapters and verses. It's one continuous thought. It's a letter that's being written. So I had to pour into the, the verse of 11. And we'll break it down. We'll look at it in, in a little more detail. We'll go into it with some other scriptures. But um, God's got a plan. And his plan's not thwarted. And it never will be. And it's not, oh, what do I do now? It was his perfect plan for salvation to come to all. And all I can say is, Wow, God. <laughs> wow. My question is way, way past because you passed me. Sorry, and I'm listening. I'm going to put air on everybody's sure. talk. Sure. <laughs> and what is your question? I had a clientele of Seven Day Adventist women. So they brought it out to me. The scripture says God, that, Jesus, that God divorced the Jews. And I came back and told her, I said, it's not the same divorce as a man and wife. And I'm so glad she didn't have me elaborate on it. So I'll let you elaborate on it. Okay. <laughs> when God, I'd have to go into those verses and break it down from the Hebrew with you. But what God is saying is the same thing that he's saying here. There's a partial setting aside. God had a plan to use the Jewish people to take the salvation message to the ends of the earth. Because the Jews dropped that ball. <laughs> it, bless you. It's like... I prefer the word setting aside for a time. It's, it's, see, divorce does is a cutting off. It's not that kind of divorce. It's, okay, I'm going to separate from you. I'm going to take the, the gospel message through the Gentile to get back to you Jewish people because you're not picking it up and going with it, so I'm going to go through the back door, in essence, and bring it back to you. So if it was a divorce, if it was a cutoff, it wouldn't be to bring it back to them and it wouldn't be to bring them in. And we're going to see that extensively in Romans 11. So let me look up that verse specifically from the Hebrew and give you the Hebrew meaning of it. And, yeah. and it'll fit yeah, right in with chapter 11 next week. That's, I think that's what's throwing them off. Because Israel's called God's wife. It's what? Israel is God's wife. Like the church is the bride of Christ, Israel is called God's wife. So it's using it in that, but you have to know and understand um, what it means. Uh, the same way I did read you those verses of how he would, um, for a time, hide from them. That doesn't mean that nobody Jewish could find God or I wouldn't be saved. And Paul, who wrote this to us, wouldn't be saved. And any other Jewish believers that, that you've known or heard testimony, so it, it's not a complete, they're looking at that saying, divorce, done, done away. No, I'm going to say... Would the word separation been better? Yes. Than divorce? Yes. Yeah. And separated for a time. Yes. Yeah. I'll give you what it is from the Hebrew and see if that doesn't help. Oh. And it will tie in very okay. well with Romans 11. So it's really on target. It probably is good that you had to wait till now <laughs> because it'll fit right in well with where we're at. We're going to go in extensively to how we see that the, there is no room for the replacement theology. We're going to talk about that graph to the end and what that means because that's what we're coming into. And we'll see God's ultimate plan that salvation still is and will be carried through Jewish hands to the hands of the earth also. So it's a great chapter coming up. It is Israel's future. Um, although that doesn't mean that it starts because right now verse 11, I mean verse 1 of chapter 11 is dealing with the here and now, where we're at right now. So it's a blending, you know, as we see. Any other questions, comments? Okay, well, it's been good. It's been good questions. I hope that even though it's taken us a little longer because of that, that still you're all being blessed by the Word of God and that it gets clear to you. And some of this is so critically important because, honestly, you may go to a quote, good church this Sunday and be taught the opposite of what I'm teaching. And I want you to be able to back it up from the Word of God. Not from what Rochelle says, but what the Word of God says. This teaching is prevalent today. It's found in what is, <laughs> my kitty just got me, what is good um, 
good churches for other reasons, they're just bad in their doctrine regarding Israel, but it, it is critical because we need to get the truth out there. This is Satan's lie to keep people from going to the Jewish people with the gospel. Oh, they can't believe or they're not going to believe or that's for another time. There's all kinds of, of ways that, that Satan uses this for his good against reaching the Jewish people with the truth today. I, for one, am so thankful that there was one who witnessed to my dad faithfully so that it was even given to me so that I could carry it on. It is critically important we don't wipe out a people and we don't ignore them. And many, many Gentile churches have a great missions program that look and see if they're doing anything to the Jew. It's the few and far in between who are, sadly. Don't skip the Jewish people. Don't take it away from the Gentiles, but add us Jews in there too. Ruth, unmute yourself if you can. Not there yet. Not there yet. Try to unmute. There we go. Is that better now? Yes. Okay. It's not just the Jewish people who did not realize that Jesus is Jewish. Um, this goes back a ways, and I'm going to make it real short. When I went to get baptized when I was a little girl, I was not aware of this. I was still a baby. The priest of the Slovak Catholic Church said to my mother and my father, I cannot baptize her, Ruth Ann. And my mother said, why? She says, and he told my mother, and this is verbatim that my mother told me, he said that that's a Jewish name. It Ruth is. is a Jewish name, and therefore I cannot baptize her as a Jew. Wow. Now, I was baptized Aunt Ruth, but and it's not just the Jewish people who are not aware of Jesus. So this is Absolutely. why Absolutely. It's, it's not, not to stand on a platform that the Jews don't know. It's us Christians that don't know either. Absolutely. You know, it's it's amazing. You know, my mother only went to school up until third grade, and she became ill. And maybe he did the same. I don't know. But you it's know, not just the Jewish people. It's not by any means, and I'm glad you said it, because if I didn't make that clear, and here I do see Satan at work to keep that from the world. Because, yes, the Gentiles grow up with a Gentile Jesus. How do they miss all the Jewishness in the scripture? I don't get it, but I know it's all around me. I know that, that I've been given the privilege because of my background of sharing it with literally those who have the doctorates, the PhDs, who were unaware of, okay, sorry, there's something going on, who were unaware of the Jewishness of Jesus. But I, I think it's a ploy of Satan to keep the truth from going out. And yes, the, the dear Gentiles need to be educated also. I think most of my friends growing up would say, well, we only knew Jesus was Jewish because of you. You know, sadly, it's not preached from the pulpits of the Gentile churches. It, it's missed, and a lot of times it's missed because way back there was the animosity. The Jews killed Christ, so we don't like them. We don't want, you know, and they, that's why they pulled away and separated. When you have way back first, second century, when you have sibling rivalry between the Jews and the Christians, it was the, the Christian world. First, the Jews persecuted the Christians. Look at Saul before he became Paul. That's part of our history. We have to own up to that. It was wrong. But then it's just as wrong when the Christians, quote, started persecuting the Jews and coming against the Jews. And the, the, it was done by those who were not Christians, like Constantine, who put down edicts. Whether he was saved or not is God to judge, I'm not saying. But he separated the Jewishness from the Christianity. You can't go to a Passover. You can't see that Easter is part of Passover. No, that's got to be separated. You can't go worship on a Saturday. You have to go on a Sunday further apart. And they just kept pulling and pulling apart. Then when you get these churches that are young and don't have all the Word of God like we do today because it wasn't all written and, and able to go buy it at your bookstore, they now don't have Jewish people mixed into the church to educate them on the Jewishness of the scriptures, and they move on down the line, not knowing the Jewishness. It was so bad in Israel, one of our tour guides had a Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox group that were there together, and all they wanted to do was go to all the, the church sites, the Greek Orthodox and the Catholic churches, and see all those. And about halfway through the tour, and, and the tour guide is Jewish, okay? Halfway through the tour, two of her women come up to her and said, Susan, 
We are confused. When Jesus was born, was he Greek Orthodox or was he Roman Catholic? <laughs> and she burst out laughing and said, ladies, Jesus was Jewish. And they're like, oh, what? <laughs> so yes, you are so right on target. They don't know it. They're not taught it. It's left out. We've got to bring it back. See the whole Bible. See the Jewishness from Bereshit to Revelation, not from, from Genesis to Malachi all the way through to Revelation, the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. <laughs> Sorry, my kitty's in my yes, Well, I, I feel, but I, don't, I think they, they teach that Jesus was born in the Jewish people, but they Yes, from the New Testament and from a Gentile perspective. They lose the Jewishness there. They don't see why Jesus did what he did. They don't even understand Paul, who still went to Jerusalem at Passover time and these other things. They don't understand the book of Hebrews. You know, yes, they, they miss all of that. And they, they do, they teach just from the New Testament and they don't bring out the background. They don't bring out what was in, in the original. That's the basis. It's like going to junior high and not having gone to elementary school. You know, you, your foundation isn't there. But they do that. And is the gospel story complete without the Jewishness there? Yes. Yes. You're not saved because you know Jesus is Jewish. You're saved because you know he is God. And he came to, to, to give his sinless blood in your place. So yes, the gospel is there. But don't miss the whole picture. Because it, there's so much more that God wants you to know. And you learn it as a whole. You you. You see it in living color when you bring in the Jewishness, okay? You, you've got salvation in black and white, but let's make salvation in color. <laughs> so, yes. But, but what yes. didn't they teach uh, worshiping on Sunday before Constantine? It, or was it af just after? I think Constantine um, made it the edict, but it, but it was... It was going on before, yes. It was going on before. Yeah, so yeah. I'll go back. So. I'll go yeah. back and bring up. That's how they separated the Jews from the Gentiles. Yeah. yeah, it was one Saturday of the things. Saturday worship, Sunday worship. Glad to have you back. Shalom. Lord bless you. Yes, yes. 